Good morning from the Oklahoma Insurance Department. My name is Rachel Fan, and I work in the Communications Division here at OID. Thank you for joining us for our Medicare Mondays webinar series. For your awareness, I do want to mention that this webinar is being recorded. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about what the Oklahoma Insurance Department, or OID, does. OID is a state agency, and we are responsible for regulating the insurance market and enforcing the insurance-related laws of the state. We have an entire team devoted to protecting consumers by providing them with accurate information and timely assistance. We can also deal with your insurance company if you cannot reach an agreement regarding a claim. If you would like to reach out to us for help or if you have any questions, you can call us toll free at 1-800-522-0071. You can also visit our website at oid.ok.gov. For today's webinar, you will be able to see and hear us. However, we cannot see or hear you. If you have a question, please feel free to post that in the chat. Down at the bottom of your screen, you will see several options, one of those being chat. And if you click on that, you can type your question there. We will save time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ray Walker. Ray is the Divisional Director for the Medicare Assistance Program at the Oklahoma Insurance Department. Mr. Walker has over 20 years of experience working in and around the healthcare industry, primarily in insurance, and has had the privilege of speaking to groups across the state and around the country. Ray, over to you. Thanks, Rachel, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our very first Medicare Monday, and we hope that these are going to be very informative webinars that we're going to do throughout the year, and we're hoping you can join us for them. Uh, here's the schedule of the events that we've got planned. Uh, next one in July, we're going to talk about programs that are available for low income assistance. And even though you may not need these programs, you might know of someone that would benefit from them. So please take the time to join us for that. And then in August, we'll talk about various options that are available to people who have Medicare, such as the prescription drug plans, the Medicare Advantage plans, and the Medicare supplement plans. So, as you can see, there's a variety of topics we'll be covering, and we hope that you can join us for those. But for today, what we'd like to talk to you about is fraud. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about our program. The Medicare Assistance Program is housed at the Oklahoma Insurance Department, but we're actually funded by the Administration for Community Living. So, we get federal grants that actually fund the work that we do. And our job is to provide education and assistance to Medicare beneficiaries to answer their questions about Medicare. Uh, what, are, what do I do to get enrolled in Medicare? What are my different options? What do I do if I have a claims problem? What do I do if I think I've been a victim of fraud? And so we really wanna to try to do as much as we can to make sure that the people in Oklahoma who rely on Medicare are as educated as they can be. And we don't do this by ourselves because there's only about five of us in the office. We partner with a variety of agencies around the state, such as the Area Agencies on Aging, to provide this same education in their areas. So we hope that you'll reach out to us or to one of those agencies. And if you'd like to know which of those agencies are in your area, don't hesitate to give us a call and we'd be happy to share that information with you. So let's get on to our topic for today. The reason why we chose this topic of Medicare fraud is because June is Medicare Fraud Prevention Month. As specifically, right now, we're in Medicare Fraud Prevention Week. So I really want to make sure that people are aware that this is a huge problem. Uh, a lot of money is lost, and we've got to do everything that we can to try to prevent this. So what exactly is healthcare fraud? Um, the best way to look at it is the different ways that it could take a, a form, such as being billed for services that you did not receive. You know, uh, something shows up on your Medicare summary notice and you're like, well, I don't recall ever having that test done. Or being billed for something different than what you might have received. You may have gone to the doctor and had an examination or something, but you notice on your bill, it shows that you received some kind of injection, but you don't remember getting that injection. Being billed for something you for that you that was not medically necessary. Let's say that you went to the doctor for a little cough and you feel like, gee, I feel like they did more than they really needed to at that appointment. Or being billed for the same service more than once. Maybe you did go to the doctor and maybe they did run a certain test. But when you get the bill, you notice that it's showing multiple charges for the same test. Those are just some examples of what healthcare fraud could look like. 
Now, now not, every, not everything that occurs is fraud. In fact, the majority of things that occur are simple errors, just human mistakes that can be made when they're filling out the forms. Uh, if you've looked at any of the records that are created when you go to the doctor, you'll remember that pretty much everything is done based on numbers, such as you as a beneficiary have a Medicare number. Uh, the services that the doctor provides, they all have these codes that represent those services, and that's what they put onto the document that they submit to get reimbursed. So it's very easy, as you can imagine, to accidentally push the wrong key or something. And oftentimes that doesn't get caught unless you, as the beneficiary, take the time to contact the provider and point that out to them. So it, it's it, if everyone would just take the time to correct those errors that aren't anybody's fault, it would make a huge, huge difference in the amount of money that is lost every year. Speaking of which, if you were to guess how much we're losing every year to Medicare fraud, how much would you say that is? Five to 10 million, 25 to 125 million? What's your best guess? I would imagine that most of you are used to going to the biggest number whenever you've been asked these types of questions before when you've had an event like this. And that is true. It's estimated that we lose $60 billion a year to Medicare fraud, errors, and abuse. And again, the biggest part of that is, is just human error. And as you can see from this graph from 2018, that's more than a lot of other government entities that are out there. And you might ask yourself, why? Why is so much being lost? Well, think about the type of program that Medicare is. There's a whole lot of providers, individual providers in business for themselves. There is a whole lot of individual Medicare beneficiaries seeking services. And so there, there are so many moving parts in this system that there are a number of places where those errors could occur. And the bad guys, they count on that. They count on the fact that there are so many places where something could get missed or overlooked, and they'll identify those and move on in on those quickly. So that's one of the reasons why this is such a huge issue. And the reason that we say that it's over 60 billion is we really don't have a solid number that we know is lost. That's what we know about. Uh, there's probably more that has gone unreported. So what is the purpose behind the S&P program? What are we trying to educate Medicare beneficiaries about? The three things that we preach are one, protect, two, detect, and three, report. Let's get into those a little bit more. The first step is to protect. The things that we want you to do is to educate yourself about Medicare fraud. Pay attention to what's going on. Oftentimes on the news, they're talking about scams, not just related to Medicare, but other areas where the bad guys are trying to take advantage of consumers. We also want you to protect your Medicare card and your social security number. Those numbers are very, very valuable to the bad guys when they're trying to file false claims or they're trying to steal your identity or something like that. As all of you who are on Medicare know, your Medicare number used to be your social security number with a letter tacked onto it. That changed several years ago, and now the Medicare number is a completely unidentified, it's not tied to any account or anything. It's a combination of numbers and letters that uh, doesn't tie to your social security, your bank account, nothing like that. So that's been a big help because it no longer has the social security number. However, bad guys can still use the new Medicare numbers to commit fraud. So you wanna protect that number. And as always, your social security number is tied to all sorts of things, your mortgage, your credit cards, all of that stuff. So be very, very careful about who you provide that information to. We also want you to report any suspicious activity to our program at the Oklahoma Insurance Department, because if we can get everybody who is enrolled in Medicare to get in the habit of reporting suspicious activity, even if you didn't fall for it, we collect that information. We document all of the phone calls that we receive, and we can start trending that information. We can track it and see, hmm, we're getting an awful lot of calls about COVID fraud, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, you know, get in that habit, keep our number handy and give us a call and let us know if you're getting calls from people who are claiming to be from Medicare and want to get your numbers and stuff. 
The other thing we want you to do, or rather do not, is don't give out your Medicare number, your Medicare card, your Social Security card, any of that information to anyone except your doctor or people that you know should have it. Not everybody that calls you on the phone is honest. Uh, in fact, if somebody calls you and asks for that information, they're probably not doing it for valid reasons. Uh, don't accept any medical supplies or services from a door-to-door -door salesman or from someone who calls you over the phone. The same would be true is if you see an ad on the television set for a knee brace or an elbow brace or something like that telling you to call now and that it's covered by Medicare, you really should think twice about doing something like that. Any equipment that you're receiving, you really need to be getting that from your doctor. If you have questions about an ad you saw on television, consult your physician. Ask them, do you think this would be a good deal or do you think this is a good idea? And let them help you make the correct decision for you. Uh, don't allow anyone except your doctor or any other Medicare provider to review your medical records or, recommended, or recommend any kind of service for you. That's something that needs to be done as part of a personal relationship between you and your physician. Sometimes in conjunction with these television ads that are on TV, they'll have you, uh, they'll talk to you about your situation and then they'll transfer you to a physician that's on their payroll to do a, you know, examination, quote unquote, and decide whether or not you need that knee brace or elbow brace or something like that. And in those situations, those doctors are basically paid to say, yep, this person needs a knee brace. So don't fall for that. Talk to your doctor, not somebody else's. So that was step one. Now let's talk about step two. That's detect. We want people to get in the habit of using a calendar or you can use one of these personal healthcare journals that we can provide to you. They don't cost anything. And you can just contact our office and we'd be happy to send you one. We want you to keep track of all your medical visits and all the services that you receive. There's a place in that healthcare journal where you can keep track of your allergies, your current medications, any past surgeries that you've received, uh, your family history. You know how what it's like when you go to the doctor's office the first time and they want all that information from you and you have to sit there and rack your brain to remember when all that occurred. Well, if you use one of these healthcare journals, all of that information will be available. You can just take it with you, fill out the forms. It's much less of a headache. But the other thing that's great about the healthcare journals is it gives you a place to document your doctor visits. When did you go? Who did you see? What did they do? Why were you going to the doctor to begin with? And what was the outcome of the appointment? That's very handy because then once you have documented that information and you go back home, when you get your Medicare summary notice in the mail, you'll be able to go back and compare the information on the Medicare summary notice to the information in your healthcare journal. Uh, that helps us prevent fraud because if you look in that healthcare journal, and it says you didn't go to the doctor on October 15th, then that gives you a clue. You need to reach out to that provider and say, so why do you have down that I went and saw you on the 15th? I don't show that. So good way to compare those notes and not have to rely on your brain to keep all of that information straight. So when that Medicare summary notice comes out, and by the way, the Medicare summary notice, that's the document that comes from Medicare on a quarterly basis. Most people have been getting them for forever. They get them every three months and it shows all the services that you received uh, through that are paid for possibly through Medicare. And the uh, you can actually get one anytime you want one. If you've lost your Medicare summary notice, you can call 1-800-MEDICARE and request another one. I would also, if you have not been receiving them and you think you should have, call 1-800-MEDICARE and request, hey, I don't think I'm getting my Medicare summary notices. Could you please check the address and make sure it's correct? Now, the other way some people are getting their Medicare summary notices now is electronically. People that are comfortable using a computer can request to get their Medicare summary notice on a monthly basis by going on to mymedicare.gov and setting up an account. When you do this, you'll start receiving those Medicare summary notices via the internet versus through the mail. Now, unfortunately, you can't get both. You have to decide whether you wanna get it electronically or through the mail. Uh, one of the nice things about getting the monthly notices via the computer is you can keep those very easily electronically. So if you need to go back a few months or 
just want to look at the most current one, all of that information is contained there. So it's something you might seriously want to consider if you're uh, comfortable using computers. This is an example of what your MSN looks like. And as you can see, it has your name on it. It has the, now this one, as you can tell, this is an old one. This is the one before they changed the Medicare numbers. Uh, but it will have like the last digits of the Medicare number. It'll have the date of the notice. And it'll also tell you the, the time frame for which claims were received uh, for this particular Medicare summary notice. It gives you information about if you've met the deductible for your plan, for instance, this is a Part B Medicare summary notice, and the Part B deductible this year is $226, not the $162 that's on here. And then it'll tell you where you are in terms of meeting that deductible. It will let you know if all the claims uh, and costs on this particular Medicare summary notice were approved. In other words, was there anything that Medicare denied? And if you see no, that means you're really going to want to look at this Medicare summary notice because there's something on here that Medicare did not pay. Now, let's look at this is what that page 3 of the Medicare summary notice would look like. And this is where it gets down into the details of what's on uh, what what claims had come in during that quarter and how they were processed. And I'm going to blow that up just a little bit here. Now, in this example, this is a claim from Lincare Incorporated. Uh, we're assuming that's a durable medical equipment provider. And in the first column, you know, at the top there in the gray bar, it tells who the provider was, their address and phone number. And then it also tells you who, who ordered it. In this case, it was a doctor by the name of John Whalen. Then also in the, in the first column below that, it talks about what exactly was ordered. What was the equipment? In this case, it was an oxygen concentrator. Was the item or service approved? Yes, it was. That's number five on here. That's important because if you see no, that means that Medicare denied that claim. And you'll want to delve into that and find out why it is that Medicare did that. Oftentimes, the best way to do that, if you look in the very last column, I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but in the very last column where it says see notes below, there'll be a letter there that corresponds with a footnote. And you can go down to that footnote and oftentimes it will tell you that's the reason why it was denied. Then in the second column, it says the amount that the supplier charged. Now, as you can see there, the amount charged was significantly higher than the amount that Medicare approved for payment. Uh, that's not uncommon. Providers will oftentimes have a higher charge for a piece of equipment, but Medicare has their own approved Medicare fee schedule. So in this situation, instead of, instead of paying a monthly rental of $117.61 for that oxygen concentrator, Medicare's fee schedule is $28.77, of which Medicare is going to pay $23.02 because they pay 80% of the charges, and the beneficiary is responsible for $5.75. So then you can see at the bottom down there, that's where those, there's these footnotes, and you can always pay attention to those to know exactly if anything was paid differently or anything that you should be aware of related to those charges. So that's the Medicare summary notice, and if you use that in conjunction with your healthcare journal, you should be able to catch any of those mistakes. Now, step three is very, very critical. You can go through step one, you can do step two, you can do all of those things very, very well, but if you don't report any suspected fraud, then the bad guys get away with it. Uh, I and my team spend a lot of time out there educating people, talking to beneficiaries, trying to keep up on what the latest scams are, but you know what? Unless we hear uh, from you guys when you think something's suspicious, the bad guys get away with it. So if you suspect fraud or you notice something suspicious, give us a call. Our number is 800-763-2828. Um, we're happy to talk to you about it. Even if it turns out not to be fraud, we can discuss with you what it might possibly be and help you work through if there is a problem of some other kind. So if you think there, it was a billing error or a service error, we talked about how human nature, you know, we, we're going to make mistakes. Go ahead and call the provider. You know, say, hey, I saw this on my Medicare summary notice and it doesn't look right to me. If it's legit, they're happy to explain it to you. And uh, if it is a mistake, they'll apologize and correct the error. 
However, if they don't explain it to you or they don't correct the error, that's when we'd like for you to give us a call at the uh, MAP program. Now, let's look at some potential uh, cases of, uh, or we're going to get to that in a minute. I apologize. We talked about how billions of dollars are lost in taxpayer dollars. This is your money. This is money that's going to waste every year because people don't get it reported or because by the time it gets reported, the money is gone. A lot of the fraud that takes place happens overseas. It's not happening here in the United States. And when that happens, once that money leaves the country, it's almost impossible to get it back. The other thing that's the, a problem with fraud, when equipment is sent to you fraudulently and it's not ordered by your doctor, it can actually hurt you. People have actually had physical damage done when they were wearing a brace that really wasn't fitted to them properly. So you don't wanna do that. The other thing that's important about this is when someone uses your Medicare benefits to file a false claim, you may not have those benefits anymore when you need them later on. An example of this would be a wheelchair. Medicare just doesn't dole out wheelchairs on a daily basis. And if a bad guy uses your Medicare number to purchase a wheelchair, and then for some reason you need a wheelchair next month, next year, something like that, Medicare is gonna say, we show that we already bought you a wheelchair and you're not eligible for another one for at least five years. So it's very important that you, you report any suspected fraud. Now we're gonna talk about some of the examples that we see out there uh, related to fraud that uh, hopefully will kind of spark some interest in you. The phone call scams are probably the most common. Here's an example where someone called claiming to be from Medicare and stating that you were eligible for some free services. The caller stated all they needed in return uh, was your information, such as your Medicare number. And you gave them the Medicare number, but you didn't receive any of those services or hear back from the caller. So what's not right in this situation? Well, let's go back to the first bullet point. This person is calling from Medicare, and yet they say you, they need your Medicare number. Medicare has your Medicare number. They won't need it from you. So if anyone calls saying they're from Social Security or Medicare and they need you to give them that number, don't fall for it. Those agencies will never ask for that information over the telephone. So if you do run into that situation, you need to report it. Now let's talk about DME like we did a minute ago. You got a friend, Mr. Smith, who received a call claiming to be from someone from Medicare asking if he had back pain. And they took his Medicare number. Uh, and next week he received a back brace uh, that his doctor did not order. This is from some other doctor that, that actually wrote the, the order for this. And then a month later, he gets his Medicare summary notice and sees where Medicare was charged over $1,000 for this back brace that didn't work. So in this situation, here's another time when he needs to be calling to uh, report this uh, as fraud. COVID-19 scam. Boy, it wasn't any time when COVID-19 came out that the fraud started happening. This was actually based on a real case. A person called saying they received two boxes of COVID-19 tests. One of the boxes came to their home address, the other one came to their PO box, and he had not re requested any tests. In working with our counselor at the Medicare Assistance Program, they reviewed the Medicare summary notice, and they found that six claims had been turned in for this person from four different providers. So a whole lot more claims for test kits had come in than actual test kits that showed up as, at his house. The providers of these kits were located in Florida, Texas, and Illinois. And it just so happened that the same counselor was working another case that involved the provider from Illinois. So according to the Medicare summary notice, the providers were paid $94.08 for each box of kits. So in this situation, this gentleman allegedly had received six test kits, so a little under $600. Maybe not that much in the grand scheme of things, but when you talk about all the people that were probably uh, getting this same scam, that becomes a large amount of money very, very quickly. <laughs> uh, another example, this one is of home health care fraud. Uh, there was a nurse who wanted to, you know, offer home health services to a person who probably didn't meet the standard of being homebound. One of the things if you're going to be on, in, on home health is you have to be considered homebound to receive those services. This one, uh, they, they wanted to falsely certify that the beneficiary needed insulin 
uh, but couldn't, they weren't able to give them the, themselves their own shots. So, you know, to the beneficiary, it's like, eh, if they want to come out here and give me a shot, who am I to care? Well, you need to care. Uh, the Medicare summary, the Medicare uh, uh, funds aren't going to last forever if we just let people come out and do things uh, willy nilly. They actually need to be coming out for valid reasons to provide those services. So be sure that you're working with your doctor. Your doctor is the person that knows you. They're the ones that you've trusted with your health. So talk to them about anything you see on TV, that you see online, and ask them if it's right for you. If they're not the provider to uh, give it to you, then they'll refer you to someone that they trust. Uh, they take their jobs very, very seriously. Now, the other thing that I want to touch base on before we get to questions, if you or anyone you know would like to be a volunteer with our program, we would love to have you. Uh, the volunteers are so uh, important to our program because you can reach seniors out there that we probably might not know about, uh, whether that's a group of seniors at a church or a congregate meal site or bridge group or something like that. Uh, we use our volunteers to man booths at uh, uh, social events or health fairs and things of that nature. So if you're interested in being a part of our program, we would love to talk to you. You'll see on the screen there, there is our website as well as our phone number. So let us know. We'd be happy to hear from you. So we've got a few questions or a few minutes for questions uh, if we've got any. And so I'm going to ask my trusty assistant. Yeah, we've got a couple questions here in the chat. So the first one, I know we covered a few examples, but I want to know some specific examples of fraud that we've seen in the state of Oklahoma. Okay. So we talked about the COVID scam that we've seen, and it's been crazy. What's interesting about that one is just prior to the COVID-19 health scare, when everything went crazy, we were seeing a lot of scams that were genetic testing where they were claiming they could do a swab of the inside of your cheek and they could tell you what your risk was of, be, of getting cancer. And we had so many people that were falling for this. And I kid you not, there were actual like tents, like canopies set up at the side of the road that had signs about getting this cancer test. People were pulling up, they were giving them their Medicare number, they'd swab their cheek, the person would leave, they'd throw those swabs in the trash. So, that was so interesting because the moment that COVID took over and people weren't getting out, the same people that were committing the fraud scams just morphed into doing the COVID-19 scams because they were so closely re related. So we see a lot of those. We see a lot of the, these scams where people are claiming to be from Medicare or from Social Security asking for that information over the telephone. We've also seen some that are not quite as apparent where somebody calls to talk to someone about their health care coverage, such as whether they're on traditional Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan or something of that nature. And the next thing the person knows, somehow their insurance has changed. And while it's not as direct, it is considered a form of fraud. So anytime you see anything that seems a little bit suspicious, there's no harm in calling and saying, so was this fraud? We'd be happy to talk about it. Because a lot of times you guys are the first ones to know about a new scam that's going on out there. Perfect, I've got one other one. And just a reminder guys, if you have any additional questions, feel free to put those in the chat box at the bottom. Um, but our next question is, do I have to fill out the social security number section on the form at my doctor's office? Okay, this one is a tricky question because we get this one a lot because all, I don't know that I've ever filled out a form that didn't ask for the social security number. If you talk to social security, they will tell you no, that you do not have to provide that. As long as you've provided your Medicare number or other insurance identifier on there, that technically you don't have to put your social security number on there. Now, I will also tell you that doctor's offices are private businesses, and I have had cases where the, pro the provider has said, well, if they don't put it on there, we won't see them. So it depends on really how hard the beneficiary is willing to push, because technically speaking, they don't need the social security number. They've got all the identifying information that they need. 
but communicate with them, question it, push back on those providers if you're not comfortable having that information out there. Now, with that being said, I will tell you that providers are held to a very high standard when it comes to privacy. They recognize that they've got all your health insurance information, your date of birth. They've got a lot of HIPAA, uh, uh, HIPAA covered information in your file. So if you did give them that social security number, it's gonna be in a secure place. But again, it's a personal choice that you just have to make for yourself. Those are all the questions we have. Okay. Well, listen, thank you guys so much for joining us. One other announcement that I do want to make you aware of our fraud conferences that we've done in the past. We're going to do something a little bit different this year. We are working with the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department and the FBI. And uh, we are putting on uh, the fraud conferences. We're going to do these at Metro Tech over off Spring Lake Drive. And they're going to be from 9 to 4. We're doing it on 3 different dates, June 23rd. July 14th and July 28th on the 23rd, uh, we're going to have Elaine Dodd uh, there and she's going to be talking about financial fraud and banking fraud along with uh, someone from the Securities Commission. Then on July 14th, we'll talk about Social Security fraud and uh, Medicare fraud. And then on the 28th, cybersecurity and online scams. You are welcome to join us for those. There's not a charge for them. You see the registration uh, or the, the uh, QR code on the screen that you can use right now to uh, enroll in those events, or you can call that phone number, 405-869-2567 to get enrolled for any or all of those events. So we hope you'll take the time to join us and uh, look forward to seeing you. The uh, doors will open at 830. We'll start talking at 9. In the morning, we'll we'll meet as a big group to kind of discuss overall what the problem is. And in the afternoon, we'll have breakout sessions. And then I think that that is it. We appreciate you being with us today. Looks like we went a couple of minutes over. Uh, hope you will join us again next month for our next meeting. So I hope everybody has a great day.